Hey, this is Cam with Blacktail Studio, and this week I am making a table for free. Some of you might remember this white resin and English walnut table I made a couple years ago. It went to Hawaii and turned completely yellow. I'll have a little bit more information on how this happened and why this happened, which resin I was using. But in the meantime, I asked my client, what do you want? Do you want another table? Do you want your money back? And she said, no, 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 I definitely just want another table. So I was happy to make her another table at no charge. I normally don't like to say bad things about specific companies here. I try to keep everything pretty positive, but I do want to prevent people from making the same mistake I made. So I will say that was the Polymers Chill Epoxy. It was the Chill 2. They are really nice people, and their epoxy is a generally a pretty good quality, except it yellows terribly bad. And to show that I'm not just trying to support the brand that supports me, Liquid Glass, I've had much better results also with Eco Epoxy and Liquid Glass in terms of not yellowing. That said, any epoxy can yellow, even those art resins that say they won't yellow. I've called them, I've talked to their engineers, and they say, oh yeah, they can yellow eventually. So any epoxy can tint kind of an amber yellow eventually. Anyway, onto this build. I am using the Big Daddy bit, which my router is probably a little underpowered for it. You have to go really, really slow. It's got six flutes, so I don't know that it's actually an ideal bit for a router table. It is really, really sharp. I believe it's made from cobalt, which is even harder than tungsten, I think. If you have any engineers out there, feel free to correct me. Also note how much shavings are piled up there because I changed my dust collection from the start of this video to the end of the video, and you'll see how amazingly better it was by the end of the video. I've made a few round tables so far and I finally feel like I'm pretty good at making these molds. What I do is I make a slightly oversized mold from this melamine, cutting it about an inch bigger than the final size of my table. And I use the same circle jig that I use to cut my table. You can see that the wood will sit just inside of that. I wanted to have a couple accent pieces and I have this horrible lumber storage, which I showed in a video a couple weeks ago. So luckily for me, I could just cut off the piece I needed. This was from a sister slab, so I knew the color would match, but I didn't have to unstack the whole pile just to get this little piece. So that was kind of nice. Since I'll be cutting another perfect circle after the epoxy is poured, you don't need to be completely surgical about cutting on that line. You just want it to sit roughly inside the mold. This slab is pretty wide and it has a lot of figure and one of these corners was lifted which means the slab was slightly twisted or cupped. It's kind of hard to know on a round slab exactly what the movement was. But I've done this little trick in the past because the slab was already an inch and three quarters and I didn't want to end up much smaller than that. So I was going to embrace the epoxy aspect of this and so I was going to kind of contour and carve down that raised lip to kind of accentuate it because it'll fill with resin and that way I can keep the same slab thickness and get some kind of interesting side profile with that resin on the side. I normally don't like trying to fake live edges and natural movements like this. If you do try to follow the grain lines, that's really the best way and it will never look completely natural and this was the best that I could do. I didn't love how I did it in the end. I, I still would have done it, but I would have probably not made such jagged kind of up and downs. I would have kept it more of a smooth, thin, side profile, but this is a trick you can use if you really need to maximize the thickness of your table and you have a slight cupping or twisting. I first tried this landscape border on that white resin round table and I really didn't expect it to work as well as it did, but this is the perfect material for the sides of these round tables. It is very flexible, it is completely non-stick. You can use the same border over and over again. I actually still have the border from that white table. The problem was it wasn't quite big enough for this table. I do countersink some screws in there, run a bead of caulk, and it is perfectly watertight. Well, almost watertight. I'll show you how we had a little bit of a leak later on. I seal the top and bottom and sides of my table with the same slow curing liquid glass epoxy, but anywhere that that black resin is gonna be sitting, you need to scuff it up really well. And here I think I'm using like 150 grit sandpaper and then a brass wire wheel for those more kind of hard to reach areas. The mold release spray that I use a lot is very, very airborne. So you wanna make sure to cover any of the wood that is gonna be getting that epoxy because if any of that airborne mold release lands on your wood, that epoxy is not gonna to stick to it, which is exactly the opposite of what we want. So that is why I make sure to cover all the wood that I'm gonna be using anytime soon. Before COVID hit, I was hosting these resin workshops up at Gobi Walnut every couple months. And since COVID hit, I haven't been able to host anymore. This was the last one we had scheduled. This was in June. So we had to do kind of a socially distanced resin workshop, which was great. Everybody wore their masks. We only had 10 of the 20 people that were able to show up, which was kind of a bummer. There's Andre fixing a small leak we had. Maybe I'll make a video on how to stop an epoxy leak eventually. There's Brittany from Good Good Wood. She's doing some really cool stuff. You want to check her out. 
Anyway, I will be doing more of these in the future. If you want to know when that's going to be, go to my website, sign up for my email list, because that's where I will make all those announcements first. After having all that free help, it's kind of a bummer to be back at my house working alone, but you do what you got to do. Here was about a week later, forgot a couple screws, but you can see just how easy that landscape border comes apart from the epoxy. If there's any part of this process that doesn't make sense to you or that I might have kind of rushed through, first off, I have a video for pretty much every possible aspect of resin table making, but I won't insist that you go watch all 50 of the videos that I've made. So feel free to ask me a question. I'm really good about responding to basically every single one of those questions below. The only thing I ask is that if you get something out of this, if you like the answer that I give you, hit that little subscribe button. That's what enables me to keep making more content just like this. The way that I cut these circles is I use the circle jig and a spiral router bit. And what I do is I make a few shallow passes going only about a half inch deep. And one reason I don't go all the way is because first of all, the router bit isn't quite long enough. And second of all, you might have some blowout tear out if you go all the way through the back. So I cut this about a half inch deep. Then I go over to my router table what making that first plunge cut does is enables this bearing to ride against something perfectly round. And you can see that I'm taking these shallow passes so it's not perfectly round just yet. I had to go around a couple times, otherwise it would burn a little bit. But also take note of this dust collection. There is not a single chip or epoxy shred that is going on the table. Every single bit went right into the dust collection, which was pretty awesome. The client wanted the same 22 degree chamfer that they had on that white round table. So I actually have the exact same bit that I used. It's about a one inch cutting depth, 22 and a half degrees made from carbide. It is a, really a pretty quality bit. You do have to make a few shallow passes. I should have hooked up the dust collection. You can see what a mess I made. I can't actually remember why I didn't hook up the dust collection for this, but it does work really well on these Festool routers. It has a little shroud that even goes around and catches probably about 80 to 90% of the chips, which is pretty good for a the client also absolutely loved the legs that were on the last table, so they wanted the exact same ones. I didn't ask her to ship the table back. I told her she could keep that white round table or dispose of it or donate it or whatever she wanted to do, but I was going to supply her with a new set of legs, which I got from Symmetry Hardware. And I'll give you a little bit of a spoiler. That shipping company lost the legs, the crate, they broke the crate. I'll show pictures at the end of the shattered crate and the legs didn't arrive, but she had actually kept the same legs from Symmetry Hardware and they were able to bolt right up because apparently they are that consistent with their fabrication. So thanks to Symmetry Hardware for being so consistent with the legs because only two pieces of this round table leg showed up and the center section was not there. So pretty lucky break for us that the consistency was there with Symmetry Hardware. As you saw earlier, this slab was slightly twisted and it is going to Hawaii, which is a different climate. So I really wanted to ensure this table stays perfectly flat. So I used these steel C channels from Concept 13, which I actually did not use on that white round table. So they are a really good quality C channel. I used to make my own and I find it's easier now just to order from them because they come powder coated, they come with the slots and it saves me about a day's work having to make my own. The jig I use gives me the perfect width to drop in these C channels, but the problem was they didn't go quite long enough on this one, and that was my fault for not testing before I pulled the jig up, so I had to manually hand chisel out to get just a little bit more length out of them. But again, these are from Concept 13, really high quality. They offer a discount code to all my viewers. There will be a link to that in the video description below. I don't get anything from it. They are just really nice and really cool supporters of my channel, so feel free to hit them up for your own C channels with that discount code. They also sell the same threaded inserts I use. They are up in Canada, which makes getting these a little bit harder. So I will include an Amazon alternative. And I don't think they're quite as good of a threaded insert, but they are much easier to get. If you have any questions about how to properly attach a table base, I have a full video and blog that I will include links in the video description on exactly how you should attach your table bases, especially these steel table bases like this, because you don't want to just bolt them down tight. You need to allow that wood room to move. And I have a detailed description in the blog and the video on exactly how to do that. After I got the base mounted on there, I went on to the finished sanding, which takes hours and hours and hours. I'll save you that by only having to watch a few seconds of it, but it is a pretty lengthy process. Again, I have a blog on the sanding process I do, as well as videos on this finishing process, which I have been using Rubio Monocoat for the last several months. Been loving it much more durable than the Osmo, and that client doesn't even realize that their last table was Osmo, and it was not gonna be quite as durable, so they made out a lot better with a bigger, cooler slab with a more durable finish. 
I always make sure to add links to everything in the video description below. I first thought that I might be kind of spamming people by adding these links because they're affiliate links and I get paid for it and it's great, but it's not a ton of money. It's, you know, like one or 2% of all the sales, but in the end it can actually make a little bit of a difference. And one of the things I've found is people love the links because they want to know exactly what I'm using. They're afraid of buying the wrong Rubio, buying the wrong photography light. And so I am happy to add all those links because I get paid for it, which who doesn't like getting paid for something? And apparently you guys like knowing exactly what to buy. So there will be links to this finish, the photography light, even those gloves I use, everything in the description below. I've mentioned before that I finish both sides pretty much consecutively. So I go through, buff all this in there, hit all the C channels down in the little slots, work it in pretty well, and then I go wipe it all off and basically flip it immediately. And this is to prevent any warpage. If I was to finish only one side, let it dry, sit overnight, come back, that other side can absorb moisture from the air and actually cause it to warp just that quickly. So I pretty much always finish them consecutively back to back like this. And occasionally I will have some small marks on the underside that I can buff out on the next coat. So it's not a huge deal. And yes, it does leave a small mark, but it does prevent some really big problems. This gem buffer is really, really nice. It is really heavy. It runs very quiet. And it's actually technically a sander and a buffer. I don't think it's completely necessary for applying Rubio. I do think it was necessary for applying the Osmo. So if you don't have this buffer and you don't want to spend $300 or $500 for the one with a shroud, you don't have to have it just to apply this Rubio. One of the rules for attaching these C-channels and your legs is you don't want those bolts to be super tight. You want them to be just snug. So when that wood moves about an eighth of an inch over the course of a year, it won't crack the wood. It will just slide under those bolts. You can see that this Rubio Mono Coat looked really nice after one coat. I am going to add a second coat, which I've discussed in past videos about how Rubio says not to apply it, but that you technically kind of can apply it to walnut. So I am applying a second coat here, and this will give it just a little bit more luster, a little bit more sheen, and even out any of that kind of matteness that comes from only doing one coat. I have to apologize because I didn't really get any great photos of that side that I contoured down and let the epoxy flow under, but here are the photos I did get. I am really happy with how this table turned out. My client will be sharing some photos of the tables in their space, so if you want to follow my Instagram, I will post some of those side profile pictures so you can see how that side profile kind of contour worked out in the end. I make a beautiful crate and I am not afraid to say it. I make a better crate than I make a resin table. They are very durable. They are packed in there very well, but Estes Freight found a way to destroy this crate. One end showed up completely missing. No explanation. Shattered to one side, the center was crumpled, both tables by some miracle arrived okay though. And speaking of both tables, this client was so happy with how I handled her yellow table that the next day she ordered that dining table I showed right there. So I got a $10,000 order by just making good on a mistake that I had made by making that white table that yellowed. As some of you know, every week I like to give credit to the people that make it all the way to the end of the video. So this week, start your question or comment with my name, Cam, C-A-M, and that way I will know you watched all the way to the end of the video and I promise I will answer all of your questions or comments first. As always, thanks so much. Please subscribe for more videos just like this one.